Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for coming out in the rain. I'm Christopher Hawthorne. I'm a professor of the practice at Occidental College and the chief design officer for the city of Los Angeles and Mayor Garcetti's office. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here for the opening event of a new series of events that are co-organized this year by Occidental and the mayor's office. A few thank yous before we get going. Thanks to Ali Gordon, Marty Sharkey, Jim Trinquata, President Jonathan Veach of Occidental College, to my students, many of whom are here. Students, raise your hands in my course. Um, these events are always connected to a, a seminar um, in the spring semester. So this is class time. So welcome to class, the rest of you. Um, thanks to the mayor's office. Thank you to the LA Department of Cultural Affairs, which is one of the partners for tonight's event, and everyone here on staff at Barnstall for welcoming us this evening. And hello to everybody watching on the live stream, which I gather will be more popular than typically is the case given the rain tonight. Let me give you a quick sense of the format of the program this evening. I'll make some brief introductory remarks on the themes of tonight's program, uh, architecture and place in particular followed by council member Marquise Harris Dawson, who will talk about the Destination Crenshaw project. Then we'll have our first short panel on art and place with Carolina Miranda of the LA Times and artists Rostin Wu and Ruben Ochoa. Then Jana Ireland will present photographs she's made of architecture by Paul R. Williams, California's preeminent African-American architect of the 20th century. And we'll close with a second panel on the built environment and issues of place in Los Angeles, which I will moderate, featuring architect Frederick Fisher, Helen Leung, and Elizabeth Timmy of the firm L.A. Moss, and the landscape architect Christopher Torres, and we'll have you out of here by 8.45 or 9 or so. Um, a quick plug for a couple of future events. We will be at MOCA, designed by the newly minted Pritzker prize winner Arata Isozaki. Three weeks from tonight for a conversation about preservation and the Los Angeles architecture of the 80s and 90s. And back at Oxy on April 17th to explore shade as an equity issue in an era of climate change. And both of those events are, are, are very close to filling up, so please register if you are interested in joining us, and I hope you will. So, on to architecture and place in Los Angeles. As you might have guessed, we chose this venue for a conversation about design and place for a very specific reason, which is that we're right next door to Frank Lloyd Wright's first design in Los Angeles, Hollyhock House of 1921. Hollyhock was the beginning of an earnest, if also deeply naive, effort by Wright to produce a new approach to place and uh, in LA architecture, one that was based not on imported European models, but on pre-Columbian designs, which for Wright were an indigenous part of a sort of pan-Southwestern regionalism. Meanwhile, I often hear myself or my colleagues praising certain projects for fully embodying a certain LA-ness. For example, the design strategy for the 1984 Olympics by John Jurdy and Deborah Sussman, with, it, with its exuberance and, and Pacific Rim color palette, and wouldn't it be great if we could do something similar for the 2028 games? And as much as I love these designs, um, this is a, um, a project for um, coloring the edges of, of, of retail buildings as well as streetscape. Um, as much as I love these designs by Jody and Sussman, I'm not always sure that we know precisely what we mean when we say we want a design to reflect a specific part of Los Angeles or an LA sensibility, or how that idea might have changed since 1984. And as I was preparing this introduction, it occurred to me that two of the buildings I think of as most clearly and successfully reflecting an LA ethos, Dodger Stadium here from 1962, as much an earthwork as a baseball stadium, and Union Station, 1939, blending Mission Revival spare modernism, Moorish details, and art deco, it struck me that 
both those buildings occupy the rubble and share space with the ghosts of the thriving communities that once occupied those sites, the original Chinatown in the case of Union Station, and the Chavez Ravine neighborhood, of course, in the case of Dodger Stadium, which was originally cleared to make way for this public housing project by Neutra and Alexander. Before Norman Chandler, speaking of the LA Times, decided to help get the mayor who championed that housing, Fletcher Bowron, booted out of office and replaced by Norris Paulson, shown here in the glasses. And even the liberal and pro-public housing Bowron had actively supported Japanese internment during World War II, yet another example of a community of color forcibly removed from their own neighborhoods. There is the painful history of racial covenants and redlining which left African-American architects like Williams, about whom we'll hear more later on, as I mentioned, deeply estranged from the sites of their own work. Los Angeles, always looking to the future and to remake itself, has tended to whitewash or bury those difficult memories, a symptom of a larger cultural amnesia, as Norman Klein and a number of other writers have pointed out. And separately, think, how, think of how often temporary architecture in Los Angeles has outdone permanent architecture in scale or ambition or both, as is true with D.W. Griffith's set for Babylon, which was just down the street from here, uh, and the current home of the Oscars on the right or the temporary Powell Library at UCLA by Craig Hodgetts and Ming Fung, who will be joining us um, on March 27th at MOCA for the conversation about the architecture of the 80s and 90s. In a region that Kerry McWilliams rightly called a gigantic improvisation, our connection to place can be more capricious or contingent here than elsewhere, I think it's fair to say. And if there's a thesis statement for this evening, I suppose that's it. To say nothing of the sort of aggressive improvisation practiced by engineers and state agencies deciding to, for example, run a freeway overpass right through the middle of Hollenbeck Park on the east side of Los Angeles. Before the war, too, experiments like R.M. Schindler's own house on King's Road were inspired, as he put it, by camping in Yosemite and elsewhere, suggesting LA is the breeding ground for a new anti-monumental architecture, temporary in spirit, if not in material fact. And then there's the paradoxical way in which certain landmarks seem most at home, most quintessentially LA, by the way they hold the city they symbolize at a remove. That's true of the Griffith Observatory, Pierre Koenig's Stallhouse. It's true of Lautner's Chemisphere and the Getty and another building by Frank Lloyd Wright, the Freeman House, and a whole long list of others. In recent years, encouragingly, our most meaningful expressions of place have been closer to the ground, brought down from the hills to what Rainer Bantam called the Plains of Id, with Ciclavia as the most prominent example. Still, that looming sense of impermanence or disaster is never far away. Sorry, architects. Uh, architecture and fire have long been bound together in Los Angeles, as is seen here in an early project by, by Fred Fisher. Maybe we can get him to talk a little bit about it um, later on. Or in Ed Ruscha's painting of LACMA on fire, where the point is less natural disaster and more taking a torch to certain ideas about respectable and buttoned up cultural architecture, suggesting, I think, that the job of artists and architects can be as much about dismantling outdated or self-satisfied notions of place as building new ones. And you might even argue that for some architects who came to prominence in the 1980s, including Eric Owen Moss, the most authentic expression of place has celebrated dislocation, fragmentation, a city coming apart at the seams. And over time, that dislocation turned into a kind of architectural brand that Moss, Frank Gehry, Tom Main, whose Cooper Union building in New York is shown here, and others could export around the country and the world. And we certainly couldn't launch a conversation like this one without acknowledging how all these qualities have been complicated over the last couple of decades by the rise of digital culture, which has produced its own sense of place, sometimes a refuge, sometimes a cesspool. Some of you will recognize this image 
which is the result of an experiment made by many thousands of Reddit users to create a kind of composite image, a flag, if you will, of that, of that chaotic online community. And here, in closing, is a recent tweet from um, Frank Xiong of the LA Times, a new columnist at the paper and the son of Taiwanese immigrants that suggests we keep a whole overlapping map of perspectives about what LA means in mind when we consider these questions. And a reminder that we should always be open uh, to our sense of place being reinterpreted and recast by new arrivals from someplace else and maybe see provincialism as the worst LA sin of all. Thank you. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce Council Member Marquise Harris Dawson, who has represented LA's 8th District since 2015, and before that was a longtime community organizer in South Los Angeles. Among his many legislative accomplishments is having authored Proposition, Proposition HHH, a $1.2 billion bond for permanent supportive housing, the largest investment toward ending homelessness in the nation. And he will be presenting, as I mentioned, Destination Crenshaw, which for my money is a project that addresses these themes that I've just begun to touch on, place, history, memory, vigilance against displacement, as thoughtfully as any underway in Los Angeles at the moment. Please welcome the council member. Good evening, everybody. Wow, I know it's a rainy day. But still, we can do a little bit better. We're Angelinos. The sun will come out tomorrow. Good evening, everybody. It's uh, so good to be here uh, and be a part of this conversation today. I want to thank our, our good friend uh, and fearless leader, uh, Chris Hawthorne, for inviting me and acknowledging our work. Let's give him another big round of applause. And bringing the, the next generation of uh, innovators uh, here uh, in Los Angeles to share uh, with all of us who are practicing uh, place making and place keeping here in, in the great uh, city of Los Angeles. Uh, I want to uh, talk uh, some about uh, and, and couch my comments in where I see Los Angeles in the context of the world. Um, Los Angeles is on the precipice, I believe, of becoming the capital of the West. Uh, formerly, that had been New York City, but as the world economy moves to the Pacific Rim and technology and communications becomes a major part of the way the world uh, does business and uh, works with each other, Los Angeles increasingly is at the center of that discussion, uh, both uh, technologically but also uh, physically here in our position on the west coast of Los, uh, west coast of the North America. Also, with the Olympics coming here at, at, in 2028, when you think about the investments we've made to remake our transportation system, the investments we are making to remake our housing system, the uh, investments we are going to be asked to make to remake our education system, and how we will remake uh, our healthcare system, uh, Los Angeles is set up to make 2028, not an ending point, but a jump off point. We can build the city we want to be and introduce ourselves to the world in, in 2028. One of the parts of Los Angeles that I happen to think is very, very important because it produced me, uh, I grew up, is uh, Los Angeles, like many great cities in the world and in, in Los Angeles, has a vibrant African American community. Uh, Los Angeles is, uh, among many other things, the creative capital of the world. To a large extent, that creativity is driven uh, by uh, a vibrant uh, African-American community that goes back to, to Paul Williams and, and uh, the early, early filmmakers and musicians that exported United States' culture uh, around the world. Well, when I uh, came to office, uh, we were faced with a big challenge, uh, and that is part of the transportation investment and infrastructure in Los Angeles was slated to run down the heart of the, Af through the heart of the African American community. Historically, transportation investments have been used to split communities apart and make communities go away. And so you'll see uh, behind me on the slide, there's a 
train that'll come from LAX and put you in the position to go to either the beach or to downtown Los Angeles and parts uh, beyond. If you stay on that train, eventually uh, in the years to come, you'll make it all the way uh, to West Hollywood. But the train was designed in such a way that caused great concern because it ran at grade along Crenshaw Boulevard. Crenshaw Boulevard has uh, a national identity. It's one of our great boulevards in Los Angeles that is known the world over. People know Sunset, people know Hollywood, people know Wilshire, and people also know uh, Crenshaw uh, Boulevard. If you think about uh, the, the situation of the African American community in Southern California, uh, you can understand why there was great concern about a transportation investment running through the heart of the community. If you look at uh, the, the African American population in Los Angeles, you'll see in 1910, it was really literally uh, the southern part of downtown or uh, south, uh, the beginning of South Central Avenue. You fast forward to the 1980s, and everywhere that, that is a dark blue color was a majority African American census tract. So it really went all the way northwest to almost touch the border of Beverly Hills, all the way southeast to cover all of Compton, but not only Compton, North Long Beach, uh, and parts east of it, uh, all the way into Lakewood, and so on and so forth. And then you can see all the way west uh, to Westchester and uh, the airport. You fast forward to 2010, and these numbers are now officially 10 years old because the census is taken in, 19, in 2009, uh, we're in 2019. Essentially, the part of Southern California that is a majority black is a very narrow band that is organized along, guess what? Crenshaw Boulevard. So you put a train there, and we know from uh, Metro's history uh, that anywhere they put a light rail investment, rents go up by at least 35%. So we know uh, that rents are very, very likely to go up. We also know that the, the African-American community, at least numerically as a share of Southern California, uh, is in decline. So it was cause for great concern. And so uh, being uh, the organizer and not a, a city planner or not a demographer or anything like that, we kind of did what we know how to do. We called together uh, the community and said, what should we, what should we do about this uh, problem? How should we confront this? And folks came up with the idea of having a linear 1.3 mile outdoor people's museum that celebrates the history of African American people in the city of Los Angeles. How do we uh, do that and why do we do that? When we looked across the country and we studied um, what communities did the best at resisting displacement and resisting gentrification, gentrification is a really hard thing because it's a market force. It isn't a law that the government makes. It isn't a policy that the, a business puts in place. And it isn't a, a collective decision. It is a one-by-one -one decision o amongst a bunch of people that may or may not talk to each other uh, that produce a result uh, that is demographic change. When we looked around the country, the community that did the best in the entire United States at resisting gentrification was Harlem, New York. So if you think about Manhattan and the, the, the borough of Manhattan in the city of New York, when I was a kid, there were a lot of working class neighborhoods in New York. There was Tribeca and Alphabet City and all the rest. Now in Manhattan, there are no working class neighborhoods. The last working class neighborhood in the borough of Manhattan is in fact Harlem. And if you go to Harlem now, people, it's interesting because people will complain about Harlem, but they don't think about Harlem in the context of the rest of Manhattan. When you go to Harlem, you know where you are, you know what the cultural history is, you know what the political history, and you know uh, sort of the story of, of African American people and the communities that lived in that place. And so our goal with this project is really to do to Crenshaw Boulevard in Los Angeles what was now what was done to Harlem in uh, the, 19, uh, the 1920s. We were able to um, attract the best talent in the country uh, to do this work. Uh, the architects from Perkins and Will, who've done a lot of projects that you know, the African American uh, Muse Smithsonian Museum in, in Washington, D.C., the Civil Rights Museum uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, the, um, the Civil Rights, the International Civil Rights Center in Greensboro, North Carolina, where they took 
and rebuilt uh, the lunch counter where we had the lunch count, the sit-in protest, and turned it into a museum. And a, a current project that they have on the boards now, the Motown Museum in uh, Detroit, Michigan, which will take the block that hits, the famous Hitsville was on and turn it into a museum that celebrates uh, the story of uh, the Motown music and its impact on, on the United States. And so uh, they came in and they really took up a really revolutionary process. They did a community organizing version of architects. And so they went out and talked to residents, young residents, uh, older residents, uh, businesses, legacy businesses and new businesses, immigrants and natural uh, born folks, folks from large sort of institutional African-American LA families and then what we call new LA pioneers. They talked to all those people over a series of meetings and uh, came up with this concept that we now call Destination Crenshaw. And the very name Destination Crenshaw is an assertion uh, because the way the train was designed and the transportation investment was designed, it was designed to go through South LA to get to the beach or to get to downtown. And so this project asserts no, in fact, the Crenshaw District itself, by itself, on its own, is a destination. And it's a destination where you'll see when you drive, uh, when you are ride on the train down Crenshaw, you look to your left and to your right, you're going to see the history of African American people in Los Angeles. That's important because our city, um, be, because this is a city where a lot of African Americans came to escape sort of in your face, more direct and blatant racism, oftentimes folks downplay the history of African American people. And so everywhere I go, I do a test. Uh, anybody hear of the, the, the holiday Kwanzaa? Anybody know that it was invented literally on 48th and Crenshaw? You did. That's a story that we don't often tell. The longest running television program in the history of television, Soul Train, that's an LA invention and it was filmed every week in LA with a bus going down Crenshaw Boulevard and through the community, picking kids up and auditioning them as dancers and putting them on television uh, every week. And so whether it's Paul Williams or Charles Drew or Biddy Mason and a host of other people, we'll tell those stories along that boulevard through murals, through 3D art, uh, through monuments uh, and through and in small uh, parklets. And so as we roll through the slides, you'll see uh, that the, the museum will be organized into, um, ha will have a, a unifying theme that organizes it. And it is, uh, that unifying theme is called the giant star grass. The giant star grass is a, is a grass that is native to West Africa. It's a, a grass that doesn't have a, a, a one specific roots, but it has a root system that connects to each other. And when it pops up, what you see is this very familiar five-star, uh, what sometimes is called a weed or a, um, a, a five-star a flower. Well, the interesting thing about that plant uh, that we now know uh, and why it's our unifying theme is that grass is native to West Africa and it was used as bedding hay for slave ships. Everywhere that slave ships from West Africa went in the world, this grass has taken root. We now in the U.S. know this grass as Bermuda grass. Uh, when I was growing up, it was called crab grass. Uh, and like uh, the African-American experience in this country, it is revered by many and desired by many and despised uh, by many and, and, and um, refused by many. I was in uh, Home Depot the other day uh, after I learned this, and I saw, I went in the horticulture section, and I saw there were products on the same shelf to kill crabgrass, and there were products to grow crabgrass. And that's, I was like, oh yeah, I, I recognize that. Um, and can identify that. And so we use this as a unifying theme uh, that will shape all of the monuments that we do, the shade structures that we do, the street furniture that we do, and in fact, the, even the, the uh, design of the uh, sidewalk treatment. Uh, you see here, we'll do uh, a dozen small pocket parks We'll do over 30,000 uh, acres of landscaping uh, over the area. We will replace the trees that were taken out uh, to build a train and the trees that were taken out to drive the space shuttle down Crenshaw. You remember that? We lost almost 100 trees in that process. 
And so we'll replace all of those trees with 422 trees. We'll restore the original trees. We'll add some new trees. We'll add some trees that are native to the southern part of the United States, especially Louisiana, but also West Africa and Southern California. Uh, if we go forward, you'll see that we will have a gateway monument that you'll see when the train sun sunsets. You'll see you're in the Crenshaw District of Los Angeles. Pe we believe people will know what that means. Uh, and know what that signifies, you'll be able to see the monument from the plane as you drive in because, of course, we live in the flight path. Uh, the Crenshaw Wall is the sort of existing asset that we build around. Folks know that the Crenshaw Wall has been there since the early 1970s. The city built a retaining wall. The community was mad about it. Uh, so artists took to it and began to paint murals on it. And so that has been ongoing and refreshing uh, since the 1970s. We will get the original artist. Uh, to redo their original paintings, and we will build a parklet atop it uh, so that it be, there can be a viewing area uh, for, from the park uh, over South Los Angeles. And then uh, at the northern end, as we get to, to Lamert Park, uh, we will build what's called Sankofa Park. The Sankofa uh, symbol is a very, very important one. It's a West African bird that has the ability to look backwards while it's flying forward. Uh, and it's a symbol of what we want to be able to do in this place. We want to be able to look and remember and retain the history, but we want to be able to move forward uh, into the future. And so this park will lift you up because Crenshaw has a very slight grade about, of about 30% in total when going from Hyde Park to Lamert Park. will lift you up so you get the vista of all of South LA. And all of these, uh, every step, every wall, every piece of concrete we will view as an art opportunity. Uh, and then we'll have a great gathering space there where folks can come to celebrate, to perform, uh, and to express outrage and uh, express resistance and express hope for the kind of community uh, that we all deserve to live in. And so this is uh, what somebody brilliantly called placekeeping. Uh, there, is, there is place uh, making, but we believe Crenshaw now, unlike a lot of places where memorial work is done, where we mark what has happened in the past. Crenshaw now is a very strong and vibrant African-American community. We believe if we brand it, it can be uniquely Los Angeles, uh, uniquely black, and be a destination not only for Angelinos, but for the entire world. So thank you all for giving us the time to present this, and we look forward to working with you as we build this as a part of our great city called Los Angeles. working. Hello, hello. Is this on? Not yet? See, <laughs> see. Si, si. See? Mine isn't? Do you want to? Is yours on? <laughs> hello. Oh, that's much better. <laughs> Whoa. This is going to turn into a sound art performance piece. <laughs> Um, I'm Carolina Miranda. I am a journalist at the Los Angeles Times, and I am here today with um, two LA artists uh, to do the impossible, which is to talk about LA and place and LA sensibility. Uh, to my left is Rustin Wu, who is an artist and graphic designer, um, and I'm going to let him explain a little bit in a second of what he does. Because part of what he does is he takes really complicated ideas and he synthesize the, synthesizes them in clear ways, partly as an artist, partly as a graphic designer, uh, in combination with um, community organizing groups often. Um, but just to keep things brief. And then Ruben uh, Ochoa, who is a sculptor and painter uh, originally from Oceanside and has now lived in, <laughs> go Oceanside, uh, has now lived in LA uh, for uh, how many years? 93. Oh, since 93. And then uh, Rustin has been here for 10, uh, 10 years, uh, originally from Seattle and then was living in New York City before he came here. So part of the discussion that we were going to have today is talking about an LA sensibility and art. Um, is this a little too loud? Okay. Is that okay? All right. 
<laughs> well, it, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll just shout. <laughs> So, you know, it's interesting that we're here today because I feel like I have spent a lot of time in the recent weeks thinking about what is an LA sensibility. Um, partly, I did a story for Guernica. Um, I wrote an essay thinking about maps in Los Angeles and thinking about LA as north and as east, which is how many people who live in Los Angeles think of Los Angeles. They don't think of LA as west. They think of it as the north of the east to mimic the immigration patterns that got them here. So I spent a lot of time marinating in that. And then recently, there were all of these art fairs in Los Angeles. And after the art fairs were done, after Freeze LA was done, there was this whole rash of stories uh, in the non-LA media trying to define what the LA art scene was. And I feel like all of those stories were trying to grapple with what an LA sensibility is. And I think if you're from LA, or if you've lived in LA a very long time, one of the things you realize about living in Los Angeles is this permanent condition of grappling with what LA uh, is. And so you stop trying to write those stories that try to define an LA art scene in one story. But for the sake of today, uh, <laughs> as a thought experiment, we are going to grapple uh, a little bit with how artists um, are connecting to LA as a city. And I think, you know, this is a city that is identified with a very specific movements in art when you think about you know, light and space and that kind of uh, environmental uh, installation or the, the cool pop of the, the cool school and Ed Ruscha, uh, Chicano muralism. Uh, there are all of these traditions that have emerged uh, out of here. But I was really interested in speaking with both Ruben and Rostin about how their work engages um, ideas of place. And so I wanted to start with the really, um, the monster difficult question, <laughs> which is defining, before we get to some images of their work, which is defining what some of that LA sense of place is. Um, and Rostin, you've been living here for 10 years now, and I would just love for you to give me a sense of, like, what was your view of what LA sense of place was when you first moved here versus what it might be now that you've been here for a little bit? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so, as we were sort of talking about yesterday, I think I'm not alone in this, but maybe not in the majority of a certain set of like nerds, maybe who came to LA, kind of with like things like City of Quartz or um, Nick Rainer Bonham, like as like kind of like the framework. Like you have this prefabricated critique of LA before you even get here of like, oh, LA. It's like here's what it is. Um, that's not necessarily the, the Hollywood version, but it's also it's a very peculiar lens. And I think that like when I first moved to LA, you know, you kind of I kind of had this idea of it as this you know the fortress LA, like it's like this like really kind of like oppressive place that kind of has architecture that um, that is foreboding and not friendly to pedestrians, and uh, and you kind of just feel sort of like um, you maybe kind of. Um, oppressed by your architecture all the time. And I think that that's there, you know, like you can certainly see that and, and I think all the kind of critiques of, um, you know, the freeway urbanism are, are legitimate and I think the, 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 I don't know, the value of freeway urbanism that like Bonham celebrates is also there, sure. But I mean, as, as is sort of the obvious subtext, I'll just say it, it's like, it's obviously kind of pointless to try to say like, there's a single LA sensibility. That's, <laughs> we're not gonna do it, there won't be one, it's not true. Um, but I think as I kind of lived here longer, I became more um, attuned to, I think, the, um, the sort of very local pleasures of LA. I think something that is true of LA is that it's, it's really difficult to consume it as a, as a visitor. Like, I, it's, like kind of, it's like when people come from out of town, I feel like I'm often sort of at a loss as to like what to do to show them LA. It's like a really wonderful place to live, but a kind of not very great place to visit. Like people's itineraries when they want to visit here are like, you know, just never, I will never do that. <laughs> I will never go to those four places on the same day. Like, just forget it. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> But I think another thing that really strikes me about this place is um, what I might describe as its lawlessness. Um, and this was something we talked about yesterday is just, there's so many things that are just archetypical of LA, you know, whether it's like kind of the, the style of housing that is built or uh, street vending that is just absolutely kind of iconic as like, here's a thing that's like 
very LA, but is also like formally pretty much illegal. Like there's you know the amount of like uh, illegally built subdivisions and things like that in the city. It's overwhelming. You know, there's just so much of LA that exists kind of in this gray area, and that. On the one hand, it's really wonderful. I think that it's a, actually a really special quality of the city to have this um, kind of in-betweenness and so many people sort of like scraping together these like amazing sort of hidden worlds. Um, but there's also, to my mind, something very, um, it's a, it can be a, a really um, precarious place in that way, right? Where you have a lot of selective enforcement of, of these kinds of rules. And I think a lot of those kinds of um, informal settlement, you know, especially now in this LA that's sort of trying to get its act together and clean up, you have this kind of very repressive kind of crackdown in this very selective way over like, what is the informal part of the city? So those are some of the things that kind of come to mind as like an LA sensibility when I, when I think of it. Hello? Awesome working yes. mic. So, uh, Ruben, I wanted to to put this question to you. You grew up in the region. You came to LA regularly. Um, you know, what is your sense of what constitutes a sense of place here? I think I'm still figuring it out. No, <laughs> um, it's um, LA. I, I came here. Um, my family grew up in Oshai, but we would constantly visit LA. Um, because we would sell tortillas and we'd come here to buy um, mercancy, like different goods from LA or in Tijuana. And so we'd constantly travel and then we'd go to the Million Dollar Theater. I remember having those um, like nostalgic moments going to the Grand Central Market um, in the 90s to even 2000s to now it's, it's been gentrified. It's become something else, it's become something different. Um, um, I think he yeah, um, really gourmet foods there. Yeah. Um, so, sense of place. Um, I came as a student. I came to Otis College when I was at MacArthur Park. And I chose LA over like Art Center or other schools beca um, because of the location. It reminded me closer to um, home, family, um, the swap meets, the, um, a lot of the informal economies. My family came from informal economies, so I was really drawn to that. And so I think when I define sense of place, um, now I live, you know, my studio was in East LA, I live on the west side. I, I just find it just a constant sprawl commuting. Um, even when I was at MacArthur Park, every corner of the park was a different gang, and you had to like navigate around there to go to get food at Jack in the Box or to the hardware store, and you had to encounter these three things. Um, so a sense of place for me, it's always just a fluid motion, a fluid act. Um, let's see. Um, I think like only in that, LA is kind of spending the whole day in a car running errands with yes. someone like considered a hangout, right? Like that. Yeah, I, I mean, I've had people come from out of town from other, um, some artists visiting from Australia and I'm like, all right, we're going to go see LA. You got a layover and we try to hit Red Cat, we try to hit LACMA, we try, and we're just like trying to do everything real fast. Um, I drop them off, I drive around the block and it's like, that's, 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 that's LA. <laughs> my, my morning commute is... Um, taking my son to preschool at, at um, Culver City, taking my other son to Chinese Immersion by Venice Beach, uh, by Venice, and then going to teach at USC Roski, and then somewhere trying to get to my studio and do some work. Um, so it's just constant sprawl, constant navigating, um, planning, you know, our lives on the phone, our computer, our, um, you know, I don't shave, in, at least I don't shave in the car, but um, <laughs> everything's being done in, in the vehicle. You know, one of the things that you address in your work a lot, and I think I'm going to pass this clicker over to you. Um, one of the things that you address in, in your work a lot is the idea of, and, and now I want to get a little bit into your practices as artists and how it connects with ideas of place, um, is the idea of boundary. I mean, that issue that Rostin was talking about, the freeway, the freeway was something that inspired you early on, so I'd, I'd love if you could uh, get us started with some image and talking yes. about that, I, that idea of LA. You mentioned something in our pre-conversation yesterday of LA as being this place where you're constantly navigating boundaries. Yes, I, I agree. It's always constantly navigating boundaries. And part of us, again, growing up in Southern California, was just, uh, is it better if I talk closer? Or no, it's on deeper. Huh? <laughs> yes. Um, it's crossing boundaries, and a lot of it was, um, you know, the freeway system, um, or, or, you know, spending a lot of time when we sell tortillas, we're in the van all day from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. at night. So when I came to L.A., I was just constantly in the car. And um, 
initially my work in the 90s was about identity politics, but as the work started to unfold and I started to expand and um, try to see how I could push those notions, um, I started seeing what was defining, what was affecting, um, what was defining um, identity as well, what was affecting the demographics. And for me it was a freeway system, looking at, at this like monumental you know, sculpture about, you know, built by the um, Marine Corps, um, US, uh, I'm just sorry, the Marine um, Engineer Corps, Sorry, get a name right. You guys know what I mean, right? Uh, Army Corps of Engineers, excuse me. Um, when you talk about monumentality, earthwork, it's the freeway system, this large concrete monolithic. So I had this idea of, um, usually you know, you're supposed to, they were built pretty much to get, again, like, um, like the councilman was talking about, get it from one point to another point, but to neglect all these neighborhoods and dissect these neighborhoods, bisect them. Um, so I proposed this project. I came up with this concept sketch um, to address the malfunction junction where the, in Boyle Heights in East LA, where it's um, dissected by the 10, by the 60, by the 5, by the 710. And so I, um, I proposed to create this conceptual earthwork on paper and wallpaper of the freeway of LA. I knew um, I'd never get approval to actually remove a retaining wall and see what was behind it. Um, so it was, I, you know, I pushed it as a, as a conceptual earthwork on paper. That, that's us installing it at the time. So it's um, like literally using wallpaper to remove a piece of the freeway. Yes. As if that freeway had never existed. Yeah, and see what was behind that space. And, and it all started off from, um, you can still develop one hour photos at the, uh, back in 2003, and um, go to like Fox one hour photo. So I took a lot of four by six images uh, and um, created a composite. And from there, that composite became um, each tile, which is strips of like three feet by 24 feet. Um, was like one gig. By the time I finished, it crashed. My computer killed it. Um, <laughs> but I learned that, you know, I wasn't asking for funding from the city of LA, just permission, because I got funding through a creative capital grant. And it was to, um, to create this piece. Um, so I just got permission. I had to go through all the council affairs. Uh, actually, Eric Garcetti was on the council when he approved this project. And um, um, I went through cultural affairs. And the idea was just, it had a, a lifespan to have a beginning and end up for several months. I was in a wallpaper of the freeway LA. It was just going to come up and just appear. I'm kind of like in like a Looney Tune, like you can see like this hole in the wall and maybe drive into it or not. Um, <laughs> but, and you know, because uh, you imagine like in LA, you're always constantly like, um, you imagine you're in a freeway, you're flying by, but you're always in static motion. So you're going to see this image. So you wouldn't um, be in danger. Um, so, you know, I, I did this project. It was up for, for four months. And part of the requisite was like I had to have a graffiti abatement plan because anything that goes up in LA gets tagged and bombed on. Um, and so then the city of LA, actually um, LA, oh man, LAPD approached Caltrans and said, um, we want to use this project as a sting operation to get taggers and, and graffiti artists. <laughs> and, and this is the first time as an artist that I was confronted. Like, I was like, whoa, like, they want to appropriate my project and use it for something that it was when it intended. And I had to like, you know, tell them thanks, but no thanks. Um, there, that's, not the, that's your Mike Davis vision of LA right there. <laughs> right, like that's not the intentions of the piece. Um, this is the first project they did since the 84 Olympics. They haven't put a, a photo mural or a, a photographic image since the 84 Olympics. They had a moratorium. So they also wanted to use this as a way to, um, to um, how would you say, because um, they had the 84 murals um, that became a city, um, a cultural, a cultural um, uh, cultural monument that was on Cal State property, not City of LA, but then Cal, Cal, Caltrans, sorry, um, had to now pay for all the graffiti abatement. So they were trying to figure out how to like rectify this, how to like actually properly pay artists that got their works damaged. Because when one of those murals got tagged, um, some artists would be like, hey, they destroyed my mural, even though it was like a small piece tagged, I want $60,000, you know, you know, pay for my mural. And a lot of these were like young teenagers, and so they're work, um, their wages were getting garnished, their parents' wages were getting garnished, probably their grandparents. It just went up, it was like, you know, for a 14 year old tagging something, and then you had to pay $60,000. So they wanted to use my project as a pilot. Um, but, so I told them no, and so then I had to deal with graffiti every, every 24 hours. Like, they're like, <laughs> all right, so if, instead of 10 days, you got 24 hours. Sorry, excuse me, I was getting, oh, the image is on there. Okay, sorry, I don't know the images there, but yeah, that was the tagging. Um, so um, you spent a lot of quality time on the ten. Yeah, right? I did. So I did get to learn how to shut down the freeway, and I had to take a course. I got to shut down all the shoulder. So they gave me a permit. I took a course. I had cones they set up for me. So essentially, um, whenever I had studio visits or family coming to town, 
I would shut down the freeway on the shoulder. <laughs> and, and I'd have my studio visits. I had, we you know, took a lot of homie shots, like hanging out there. Um, a lot of shots of those. Um, I had curators coming from New York. You want to see, you want to go by the studio? And we just stopped there. And they'd freak out because it's so loud and the cars are flying by. Um, there's, you know, it's just cones blocking like this threshold. And so. Yeah. All right, Anyways, let's uh, move sorry, on to yeah, some of the next that. images because I know. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll keep going. Um, I also looked, I was looking at the series of ficus trees that uproot the, the city of LA. Um, this actually, for me, occurred at my parents' house in Oceanside. The ficus tree uprooted the, the, the sidewalk. My dad called the city. They said, it's your problem. He worked in construction. He said, all right, you know. And this is like the first, and maybe I'm embellishing it. It's a, it's a memory when I was a child. I remember him just getting his buddies from construction, and they just put on their gear, and they just chopped down the tree. They chopped down the cherry tree, paved it with concrete, um, removed all the grass, all the tree. Um, we had eight-foot you know, now sidewalk, not good for climate control, uh, climate, the climate, um, sorry, for the, um, for the climate, but um, he didn't know that. He was, we thought it was cool because we had bikes, you know, we could ride around. <laughs> so, you know, I was documenting these trees and these amalgamations. Ficus trees are non-native. They um, are non-native and um, they're constantly seeking water. Concrete, in theory, is always absorbing water. So these things were just fusing and, and budding and, um, and actually grain and grain over time and becoming like this fusion. Um, and, in 2003, it was when I started photographing these to make sculptures. They were more, um, um, it mostly were happening in non affluent neighborhoods because you'd go to areas like in Santa Monica and there was actually rubber sidewalks to contend with trees and roots. Um, but since then, actually, the city actually stopped repairing these as well. So it's just proliferated everywhere, like all around the city of LA. It's um, pretty crazy. Um, and I think Steve Lopez wrote a lot of series of articles and some of the images that were posted in the LA Times, people are like, hey, is that your work? I'm like, no, it's actually, it's, it's an LA Times article. Um, so when I did get invited to do my first solo show at a museum space, I, um, I wanted to uproot the floor. I want to, to, to um, you know, we all had fantasies of reconstructing a gallery space or museum space. Um, you know, as artists of color, the white cube's always been a contentious site. So for me, it was like, I really want to do an institutional critique, but I also want to have fun and take it. And as if the floor came out, it just started crawling out. So I proposed to cut out their floor and use the museum space as, as, um, as, as my, my material for sculpture. Now, um, that first piece is um, Get Off of Me, I'm Not On You. It's um, if anyone ever had siblings, it's like that push and pull, like, Get Off of Me, I'm Not On You. The, the same experience I have with, you know, with the gallery system because you're implicit, but you know, you also, it's, you know, you hear what I'm saying, no. that's some details. Um, I came in LA in 93, and one of the first things I was seeing was the LA riots, like the aftermath, and a lot of the, um, the um, lots that were left. And so it always stayed in my mind, and so when I was, again, thinking of work, and trying to fuse materials and ideas, I started coming up with these, as if I was to take these markers of demarcation of, again, the freeway system, um, retaining walls, um, um, chain link fences. So I was trying to distill them, and this is um, as if I remove one of those sections, one of those posts, and cord it all out. Um, this is another piece where it's um, about 31 feet. It spans 31 feet, and I just distilled all the chain link fence, and it um, sits on two post footings. And so, and then this is the last one is um, if I had a rebar for every time someone tried to mold me. This is the first time I got. Uh, gallery representation, so I was concerned. I was I had to paint, make ten things, you know, ten different colors. Um, so I was like, I still want to carry this, inter continue my intervention process, my site um, responsive and site specific work, and also still address issues of um, this invisible labor, this hidden labor um, here in Southern California, and a lot of it's Mexican American. So a lot of my family work in construction. So for me, um, when I was building this installation, um, I called all my cousins at Ty Rebar, and we went and we spent seven days at the gallery. After they got off work, we were there tying rebar. I learned how to tie rebar. I know. I now am a foreman in rebar. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I, I, I know how to tie rebar now. But, you have um, a backup profession. Yeah, I do. <laughs> I went to art school to be a construction worker. Something my dad tried to keep me away from. No. <laughs> It's the, the play of materials I always find really interesting because um, chain link, I remember seeing one of your sculptures at the Whitney Museum many years and thinking about like the charged nature of chain link and what chain link signifies economically and what neighborhoods in LA you see chain link versus what neighborhoods in LA you don't see chain link. And um, having a conversation once with um, Frank Gehry and his use of chain link and him talking about how 
oh, well, on the west side, chain link is actually good when it's surrounding your tennis court. It's not cool when it's around your house, but if it's around the tennis court, yeah, chain link is great. So thank yes, you. <laughs> I agree. Yes. No, I agree. And I think for me, I was addressing those notions, but I also want to distill it more and just get to the root of, of just the, the footings and pull them out, just the, these footings of demarcation. Yeah. The boundaries. Yes. Um, okay, sorry. Rostin, uh, let's go to you. I know the, the type of you work, the work that you do is very different, uh, that oftentimes you are doing graphic designs for community groups serving advocacy roles. So I'd love to talk a little bit about how, how your work tries to define some of that place. Like, how do you define place in your work? Uh, sure. sure, sure. This one, this one, <laughs> all right. Um, Yellow. So yeah, a lot of my work um, has to do with this interaction between the people who live in a place and the people who make decisions about that place. And in the United States, we have a lot of, you know, I guess lip service to like some sort of public participation and kind of um, coherent democratic sensibility about our, our public sphere. But a lot of times it's sort of like that cash, uh, that, that check that's not really cashed. Like, so it's like, well, what happens if, if people really have the, the, the real ability to participate in this process? Um, and so I try to use visual means to, um, to work in that space, that dialogue between sort of the expert and the non-expert, the, the government and the governed. Um, so this is a kind of like one of the most direct examples I can show of that kind of work that I do. Um, it's a project I did in actually in New York with an organization called the Center for Urban Pedagogy that I co-founded. Um, and uh, it's a project with street vendors um, in, in the city, a uh, street vendor kind of, uh, is in a sense, a union of street vendors um, trying to figure out um, ways to reform the vending law. And so if you look at this thing, it's sort of like, here's where vendors are allowed to vend um, the following streets at the following time. So you have like, you know, um, this street between these hours at these days, da, 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 so on and so forth. So you can imagine even if you're a, a fluent English speaker with a law degree and uh, a lot of time on your hands, and access to like three different parts of the municipal code, like it's still really hard to figure out whether or not what you're doing is legal. Um, and that leads to a whole bunch of you know, uh, imbalances of power. So if a bricks and mortar store owner says, you can't be here, you probably don't really know if you can be there or not. And you sort of feel, well, you know, two fines and I'm basically out of business, so I'm gonna move along. Um, and so th that's not really actual access to the, the law, actual access to those protections. So the idea is to sort of take that and then the visual means just give it a really, whoa, this slide got crazy. Um, <laughs> that's not what that looks like. But um, you can imagine with your eyes um, sort of translating that into a graphic language. Um, and so we did that, tr uh, produced it in an edition of 10,000 and distributed it throughout the city. Um, and eventually it was something that the city itself realized, oh, we should actually be printing these and distributing them ourselves. Um, so that's just sort of an example of that visual translation of sort of, can you take something that is, um, for reasons that, it, it, there's no reason it has to be inaccessible, but often is produced in an inaccessible form, can you use a visual or cultural means to make that, um, to transform that, and then therefore transform that interaction on the street with a, a vendor and a police officer. Um, so that's sort of like one way I think about sort of like how does, how can like visual culture kind of transform someone's actual experience of, of a place? Um, and then sort of in a more direct way um, to, whoa, all these slides got really weird. Um, <laughs> um, I've been working for uh, five or six years. Wow, these are wild. Um, I'm a glitch artist now. This is <laughs> my, my, new, um, my new career. So. Um, You'll have to sort of imagine the images. I, I, I won't talk to them too, too, too directly. But, um, but I've been working for a few years in Skid Row uh, on developing a community plan, um, thinking about what would Skid Row look like? Um, um, this is work that was started by Teresa Huang and Skid Row Housing Trust. What would Skid Row look like if it were um, actually designed by the people who live there? And I think this is another place where LA's kind of consumability as you drive by is like really broken, right? So if you, a lot of people who don't know Skid Row very well, they think, oh, well, the only people who live in Skid Row are homeless people. And it's actually, well, there's actually a ton of low-income housing in Skid Row. And you don't see those people because they're inside of the houses, right? Um, but people have an optic of who's there and who, you know, people often are just very dismissive, like, well, who, who would even be the constituency of something like that? Yeah. And it's so, like a neighborhood that's not officially considered a neighborhood also. 
Right. So there's all these different le levels of kind of invisibility kind of on that, on that process. So, you know, one is sort of this formal document. Can you make like sort of like a visually compelling way to enter into that planning process? And then also trying to create things like this. This is a mini golf course that talks about the history of zoning in Skiro that I produced with um, LAPD, the Los Angeles Poverty Department, not the police department, um, which is a theater troupe that's been in Skid Row for the last 30 years. Um, trying to create that into like a moment that would actually get people, you know, zoning and these kinds of things that are structuring our world often kind of hide in plain sight just because they're so boring. And people think, well, I can't really access this. It's too complex. It's not really for me um, as a, as a non-expert to even engage in these kinds of meetings. And they're kind of run in that fashion a lot of times or, or sometimes in a very paternalistic kind of like, here, please give your input in a way that will never actually result in any changes. Um, so this is sort of a way of, of trying creating visibility around that rezoning process and telling the history of that, that zoning. Yeah, I, did um. a, I ended up doing a story. <laughs> wow. I ended up doing, I did all of our mics go out. <laughs> Hello. Oh, no, they're working. Oh, I ended up doing a story. This was fascinating. It was um, with the boom in downtown Skid Row has, is being slowly zoned out of existence, uh, basically. And this mini golf course took a a very complicated zoning issue and turned it into one hole in the course. And it was like a game and it was this really incredible three-dimensional visual visualization of zoning code um, and a community where people live and work. Yeah. Um, and all I, I should mention that all of this kind of work is developed in these kind of long-term collaborative processes. So it's a lot of different people's ideas of what that place is kind of get put into it. So one last project I'll show quickly. Um, is just uh, a kind of something working in the other direction. Um, I think a lot of times places, you know, people bring so much baggage to what they're seeing um, when they visit a place. So like someone who works for, say, the county, um, going around to neighborhoods in, in LA, you have a bunch of statistics or kind of media images of what that place is. And I think that can really obscure your ability to understand uh, a place. And, and it's almost impossible for someone who doesn't live somewhere in LA, I think, to really understand what the culture and what the place the place really is. That's sort of what I meant earlier on about sort of the, the difficulty of consuming LA. So much of LA is so interior, I feel like you can't really do that drive-by urbanism aspect. So I was asked by the county to create like a creative visioning process for people who lived in Willowbrook, which is a small neighborhood unincorporated LA County between Watts and Compton. And um, Basically, it became very clear very early on that that was a terrible idea, that like, people had done so many different kinds of creative visions for this neighborhood that had zero funding, nothing was going to come of them. And people had planning fatigue and were sort of like, OK, I'll, I'll participate in like, a planning <laughs> exercise if you want, like whatever. But no one had any faith or interest in like, what that might actually generate for them. And it became kind of clear to me that maybe something more valuable to do with that commission was to try to create something that would help people see what was already there in the neighborhood. <laughs> Um, so I spent uh, about six months just doing oral histories and documentations, basically making a home and garden tour of that neighborhood. So finding things like this, these are people who, um, you know, this is a couple, the, the man had like an exotic tortoise collection, and the woman uh, had an exotic cactus collection. They met and fell in love, and then they have this kind of paradise of like <laughs> cactuses and tortoises in their backyard. Um, Sunset Magazine. Yeah. Um, and then this is... Uh, an image I picked just because of this pairing. I think you'll find this interesting. This is um, someone in their front yard just had this um, huge fountain. And there's only one, one part of this very elaborate kind of stonemason masonry that they built. Um, it, it, totally self-trained stonemason. Um, was worked uh, 35 years as a butcher and built it all out of the rubble of the construction of the 105 freeway. That was sort of like free materials around. Um, this is like an all-volunteer uh, dog training facility run by two retired truck drivers. Um, they've kind of built this whole paradise, and they, they, they meet there on weekends and just do free dog training clinics, like sending people around on these courses behind them. Um, this is a, and this is just a very small, random selection of people that I met. And this is a guy who runs a horse and carriage service out of his backyard. Um, and so these kinds of images and the stories associated with them, I kind of think of that, you know, package those as a book that is now given to everyone in the county who works, for, works in Willowbrook is a way to sort of, just sort of disrupt your ideas about like, well, here's this place, I know what it is, and it's a bunch of statistics and like a Kendrick Lamar record or something. And, you know, like they have this like very pat narrative of what, what goes on there. And again, it's not that those things aren't also true, but there's just so much more, more to a place than that. And so I try to sort of bring that interior world um, into a more visibility. 
I think it's um, interesting because I think some of the things that comes up is how localized LA experiences are that, you know, one of, I lived in New York, I'm from LA, but I lived in New York for a while, and one of my impressions from New York was that if you move to New York, you become a New Yorker, whereas if you move to LA or you grow up to LA, you identify with your neighborhood. You maybe even speak in a, with the accent of your neighborhood, uh, you know, car guys from Long Beach have one accent while dudes from the east side have another and if you're a valley girl from that part of the valley <laughs> there's the and so I think that highly localized in interior um, experience um, that has to be penetrated in a way is 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 it very LA um, but I wanted to ask um, both of you um, because as part of this Guernica essay, I spent a lot of time on Twitter and on the internet just doing searches for when people say the most LA thing ever. Like, the most LA thing ever is kale chips, or the most LA thing ever is pressed juice from moon juice. There's a lot of that. And then, but th there were some really good ones too. Like, the most LA thing ever is um, Kendrick Lamar eating an elote in a palm tree, which apparently he did to shoot a video. That is the most LA thing ever, according to one guy on Twitter. And so, in my thinking about what is the most LA thing ever, in terms of these like singular worlds that kind of meet, and bump in unusual ways, I settled on this gas station in Chinatown that is um, the, the canopies for the gas station are built with uh, Chinese roof lines. They have these like ceremonial roof lines uh, from like the Han Dynasty that come up like in these upturned eaves, but then they're covered in Spanish tile. I mean, it's like ki kind of abominable and amazing <laughs> all at the same time. Like, and very Los Angeles, uh, this place where North and East meet. And so I wanted to ask you guys, what is, and it's like picking one out of, a needle out of a haystack in a way. So what is the most LA thing ever in your mind? <laughs> I had a hard time with that question. Um, I think because I, I find myself saying, that's so New York, versus like, <laughs> this is so LA. I don't, I don't know if I, because it feels like, a, like you're bagging on the city you're from, or, 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 or you call home. But um, I mean, of course, in the car, um, constantly being in the car. But I think in the end, I just thought of Los Doyers, um, the way Dodgers are portrayed. Um, and I just, that was the only thing I thought of as the most LA. It's, it's LA Doyers, but it's, um, my dad, when we drive up, we'd always go see the Dodgers, and he'd be like, almost been Los Doyers. And, and you know now they made shirts with it, and it's a logo. And so. Yeah, like Doyers is now an official term. I mean, well, well they, they, they trademarked it. Sure. Dodgers. They trademarked it. They trademarked it, so now vendors could get um, busted for selling it. <laughs> Which, that's very. I guess that's so LA. I don't know. Um, it's like I don't know. That is the most LA thing ever. Is like the illicit thing becomes legitimized, and then uh, and then the LAPD can crack down. Uh, <laughs> Rostin, what about you? Um, I guess, I mean, this is a, a little bit of a gimme, but for me, I always think it, like the LA River is, in terms of urbanism, like the most LA thing, just it, that it's like this kind of like man-made ecological disaster that also has this um, kind of unbelievable beauty to it, and it kind of gives rise to so much kind of, so much life um, that is sort of irrepressible, and then you also have sort of this looming fear that it'll be like improved out of existence and like it'll be kind of ruined. Like to me, I always, that, that feels like it kind of like embodies a lot of it for me. What, that it could become attractive and precious, is that? Yeah, and, tr and just sort of turned into some sort of like um, you know, recreational like river, river walk kind of thing. You know, I just sort of, when you sort of hear all these stories, they're like, oh, we're gonna bring back Valley River. It's like, I mean, obviously there's deep hydrological things that we need to do about the river. But it's like, but improving it as an amenity is not, is not one of them, in my, in my opinion. So that's like one of these things where like that, that's always sort of looming is like, loving the thing too much might break it, um, is kind of part of like at least my, my feelings about, about LA. Yeah. And Maybe like embracing LA's ugly parts is LA. Kind of, yeah. I mean, the other thing I thought is like when I most feel like I'm in LA is usually like the July 4th. And there's just like the firework display that is completely citywide and and totally you, illegal and totally illegal <laughs> and so beautiful, but like there's no there's no right place to see it, and it's just kind of overwhelming all around. Oh, Serena, and East LA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Thank I, you I thought so of much. Oh, car, car chases too. <laughs> 
there was that car chase where I went to actually the metro. Uh huh. Oh, like, yeah. a, like a year ago, went through the metro. I, was... <laughs> I had a car chase end up on my block recently, so that was definitely when you see your house on a freeway chase, that's pretty awesome and very LA. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks to Carolina and Ruben and Rostin. Give them another round of applause. Thank you so much. Um, I, will t I will tell you, um, Carolina, I, I avoid that gas station um, even when I'm about to run out of gas because it has the most expensive gasoline, I think, in the city of Los Angeles. I drive by it almost every day. Um, it's my pleasure now to introduce our next speaker, Jana Ireland. She was born in Philadelphia, but has chosen Los Angeles as her home. And I think that's another theme that we might return to this evening, this idea of this being a city uh, of choice and that shaping culture to a large degree here. Her work is concerned with the expression of black identity in American culture. And she's going to talk to us this evening about her photographs of the architect Paul R. Williams, Jana Ireland. Hello? Okay, great. Hi. Good evening, everyone. For the past three years, I've been photographing buildings designed by Paul Revere Williams, a legendary Los Angeles architect who practiced for 50 years and is credited with nearly 3,000 buildings. He was the first certified black architect west of the Mississippi and the first black member of the American Institute of Architects. In 2017, 37 years after his death, 44 years after his retirement, and 94 years after his AIA induction, Williams became the first black architect to win the AIA gold medal. Paul R. Williams was born in 1894 to parents who moved to Memphis from Los Angeles for the promised curative properties of the climate. Both had tuberculosis and both were dead by the time Paul Williams was four years old. Williams and his older brother ended up in separate foster homes. The woman who raised Paul Williams recognized that he was special and nurtured his skills. He decided that he wanted to become an architect and had enough confidence in himself to pursue architecture in spite of a teacher who told him it was a ridiculous dream. White people wouldn't want to hire him, the teacher promised, and black people wouldn't be able to afford to. Paul Williams persisted. He designed municipal buildings and private homes. He designed banks, churches, hospitals, university halls, and middle schools. He designed public housing projects and mansions for celebrities like Lucille Ball and Frank Sinatra. If you've ever spent an afternoon driving around Los Angeles, you've seen a Paul Williams building or two. Williams' story is one I believe only could have taken place here in Los Angeles. When he began his career here in the early 1920s, the city had three factors that allowed him to flourish. Lots of land, lots of money, and a handful of wealthy white people who were liberal or desperate enough to hire a young black architect. Subtract any of those factors, and his big story would shrink until it disappeared. Hancock Park provides a good example of how Williams' career came to be. Hancock Park was established as a residential neighborhood in the early 1920s, at the same time Paul Williams was beginning his solo practice. The Los Angeles elite could build their mansions in a new neighborhood protected by a 50-year restrictive covenant that promised that the only non-white people who would call it home would be servants. After years of violence, LA's restrictive covenants were a kinder, gentler way to keep neighborhoods white. Better to shut the undesirables out altogether than allow them to move in and have to burn crosses on their lawns later. Paul Williams designed one house in Hancock Park, then another and another, and so on. The same thing happened in Flint Ridge and Pasadena and Windsor Square. Word spread about his impeccable work throughout Hancock Park and other affluent parts of the city. Sometimes people who had heard his name would come into his office only to be shocked to find that he was black. Some turned around and left, but others stayed out of politeness. For these people, Williams developed a brilliant trick. He learned how to draw upside down as well as he could right side up. A skittish prospective client could be drawn in by the magic of watching the house that they dreamed of appear before them, 
without the impropriety of sitting next to the architect. When I began my project about Paul Williams, this and other stories about his knack for turning indignities into triumphs intrigued me. Knowing next to nothing about architecture, I wasn't sure what to look for when I walked into Williams' buildings, so I began to look for clues about the man himself. How did it feel to design homes in neighborhoods he wouldn't have been allowed to live in? How did he unwind from the incredible stress of having to defer to people who would benefit from his brilliance and his hard work without ever respecting him as a human being? When designing an intimate space for a client too prejudiced to shake his hand, did he view his work as a subversive act or something he had to do to survive? Three years ago, architect Barbara Vester approached me with an idea. She was looking for a photographer to make a study of Williams' work and wondered if I'd be interested. I had heard of Paul Williams in passing, but had no idea of the scope or scale of his work. I grew up in Philadelphia, 2,700 miles away. I loved LA, but I barely knew it. Back then, I didn't even have a driver's license. I was interested in architecture, and architecture had been slowly creeping into my work for years, but it felt too big to get my arms around. I was also busy with a one-year-old and a brand new job at USC. I was struggling to figure out how I was going to fit art into my busy new life. I was overwhelmed, and the thing I needed to get back into my own work was an assignment. That initial email from Barbara came at exactly the right time. I felt like an imposter, but I said yes. Most architectural photography is about the big picture. What does a building or room look like from the outside? I wanted to create an experience of Williams' work that was about the feeling of living in the spaces and loving them. Paul Williams thought about all the little details, and I felt that the most fitting way to honor him was to think about those details, too. I decided that the work should be in black and white to strip away distractions like the color of a carpet or a wall. One of the first Paul Williams buildings I photographed was a house in Lafayette Square, around the corner from the house he built for himself and his wife. The woman who owns the house today is the granddaughter of the original owners, a doctor and his wife who were part of the same circle of successful black professional families that the Williamses traveled in. She told me that when her grandparents were searching for a parcel of land to build their house on in the late 40s, the restrictive covenants prevented them from buying in Lafayette Square. They had a friend who could pass for white, handle all the face-to-face -face parts of the transaction, and they got their land. By the time their house was completed, the covenants had been lifted. Williams and his friends were fortunate to be savvy enough to make space for themselves in a hostile city. The history of real estate and development in Los Angeles is filled with ugly stories about redlining and other forms of institutionalized segregation, the effects of which can still be felt today. LA is one of this country's most diverse cities, but is still deeply segregated. Still, when I travel through its streets, I see a world of infinite possibilities. If Paul Williams could become one of the most notable architects of the 20th century here, what could my children become in the 21st? Paul Williams could design a neoclassical mansion or a modernist bungalow. He never stopped designing buildings to serve his own community, even as the work he did outside of it earned him the nickname Architect to the Stars. He was known for designing to fit the needs of his clients without imposing his ego. His buildings do not boast about the prowess of their architect. They do not need to. His mastery of his craft was its own reward. The story of my work about Paul Williams is all tied up with my own personal milestones. Learning to drive and learning Los Angeles by car. My pregnancy with my second child and lugging camera equipment and a big belly around strangers' houses figuring out that I could be a mother and still be an artist. I learned a lot about myself doing this work, and the work continues. I could spend the rest of my life searching for and photographing Paul Williams buildings. There are that many of them. Los Angeles is known as a city that likes to forget its history, but I think that it will always remember Paul Williams. I'm glad to help in any small way that I can. Thank you.
Um, thank you, Jana. That was really beautifully done, and I feel lucky to have been able to hear that and, and see those images. Thank you so much. Um, for the last panel of the evening, we're going to um, talk a little bit more about the built environment, and I'm really pleased. In general, I feel very lucky to have had all of these panelists tonight, and um, I'm pleased to have this group joining me to finish off the evening. Um, so Helen Leung and Elizabeth Timmy from LA Moss, I'm gonna let them introduce themselves and talk a little bit about the work of their office. Christopher Torres, um, landscape architect, who can talk a little bit about his work, and Frederick Fisher from Frederick Fisher and Partners, um, who will do the same. We'll do the reverse of what Carolina did in her panel, so we'll start with some images, um, and then we'll have a little bit of time to, um, to talk about the work, and I would, I would suggest, I would recommend to all of you that um, as you're presenting your own work, if there are themes that came up in the earlier conversations that you're interested in touching on, please, um, please do that. So let's begin with, uh, with Helen and, and uh, Elizabeth. Great, thank you so much, Christopher. Let's see if I can get this to work. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, LA Moss is an urban design nonprofit organization and we have the honor of working in LA for the last five years. Oh, I guess our slides are going to do the same funky thing. <laughs> uh, That's a Venn diagram. How we work is that we combine our expertise in policy and design to create impact. And where we work is in lower income and underserved neighborhoods in Los Angeles. Let's just say this is a metaphor for working through the city process. And these all these slides bubbles. came to me first and then wind <laughs> up in this condition. So we'll take the blame. Um, and Elizabeth and I, with our backgrounds in, my backgrounds in policy and planning, and Elizabeth's background is in architecture, our team reflects that diversity of disciplines, so we're a cross-disciplinary nonprofit organization. And uh, where we, where we work across LA, but we're based in Frogtown. Uh, Frogtown is a, once was a working class immigrant community, and uh, it's a neighborhood that has recently come on the map, and one of the two areas that we're going to talk to you briefly tonight is about how we got involved in working in housing. Uh, we got involved in housing because our organization is based in Frogtown, which is also next to the LA River, to Rossin's point earlier. Uh, the LA River and its investments has meant that the neighborhood has been changing. And for us, what we wanted to do was we were invited to have a conversation with community members about what that change could look like. How could we minimize the displacement happening and inevitably happening in neighborhoods like this? And so we had a facilitated conversation where community members uh, shared with us what they thought. And one of the many things we heard was that community members wanted there to be greater housing affordability, but they didn't want the typical affordable housing projects that one may see, high density, big, maybe not well designed. And people uh, would say, we don't, we don't want something like that, but isn't there this thing called a granny flat or a backyard home? How can I do that? And uh, so what is a, a backyard home or an accessory dwelling unit? It's this new second property that's been legalized and is kind of doubling the density of our residential neighborhoods throughout the city. And uh, a couple years ago, in partnership with the city, we designed an ADU pilot to go through some very crazy uh, Byzantine processes under state law to inform future policy, and this is it. The ADU was sited in a historic neighborhood, and we went with a playful uh, craftsman style. Um, it will be completed by the end of this month. Um, however, for us, the takeaway was that we couldn't ensure that this was affordable. So we, after doing some research with a lot of homeowners, <laughs> um, we talked to over 100 homeowners in Los Angeles and we wanted to figure out how can we create homes, ADUs, that are affordable for the homeowner and also affordable for the tenant. And thus was born the Backyard Homes Project. It's a one-stop shop meant to help homeowners build backyard homes. We help with design, permitting, financing, construction, and leasing. And the basic premise is that we leverage the Section 8 program and we help homeowners through the process of hiring an architect, figuring out how to finance it, how to design it, how to permit it, how to find a tenant. So the value proposition is that you house someone who's low income for five years, and in return, we will help you through the whole process. Um, and Elizabeth is going to share about the design. Uh, for us, it was really important that these homes look more, uh, they, they kind of represent the diversity of Los Angeles. And we see a lot of kind of latent diversity in the architectural character of the city. And so for us, this was a kind of poetic way to give justice to that. 
Uh, we created seven plans, um, and then you see at the bottom, each of those seven plans have seven kind of architectural characters or features. Uh, features. And um, we are giving each home the option of kind of multiple color palettes or identities, uh, style kits. And we think affordable housing shouldn't look affordable. Los Angeles has this really great history of bucking tropes and challenging norms, and we see the backyard home as a potential to really do that and to uh, kind of have residents lead resident-led density. And if you're intrigued and you're a homeowner and you want to learn more, we're having an open house next uh, Tuesday at Venice uh, Community Housing, and we're accepting applications until May 1st. The second area of our work is uh, what you commonly see throughout LA. What we mentioned earlier, chain link fences, abandoned sidewalks, empty underpasses. Uh, we were invited. <laughs> we were invited. Say public realm. We were invited to work in the public realm um, near our metro station, Northeast LA, the Cypress Lincoln Heights station. And our goal for this Go Avenue 26 project was to support people, pedestrians and transit users who have no choice but to walk and to take transit and figure out how can we support them in feeling safer, in creating a sense of identity and in supporting the wayfinding of that experience. And so this is an image that shows us working across multiple jurisdictions and territories. What we have is signage that's wrapping across and in front of Caltrans space. We have arrows and wayfinding cues on a Los Angeles fence. And we have appropriated kind of graphic signage um, that is for the pedestrian on an LA sidewalk. And we went about this project by kind of using stickers, MACTAC stickers, to uh, give wayfinding cues for bus routes and embedded in murals kind of semi-illegal uh, wayfinding strategies for Metro on Caltrans walls, but also kind of tried to clarify uh, bike and pedestrian transit, which was happening on the sidewalk informally. And that process for a three-month installation was a lot of bureaucracy. What you see here is a map of what we had to jump through to get something permitted temporarily. And what we learned was that temporary wasn't enough. It wasn't resilient enough. And we got to test um, how we can actually institutionalize installations like that through another project. The mayor has a great streets initiative, and we were invited to work on Western Avenue in the heart of Koreatown, adjacent to many different communities. And in this project, what we did was we um, accepted the built environment as it was and tried to understand the people who worked and who lived and who frequent that area. So what we did was we met people where they were. We talked to business owners. We understood their history, their desires. And rather than saying, this project is going to promise you a transformation of your hopes and dreams, uh, what we were able to do uh, was to be able to unpack the values and have our project be able to reflect that. And, and a, a big takeaway for us after all that engagement was that this is a kind of highly pedestrian uh, group, a culture, uh, very high uh, public transit ridership, and, and very low uh, verdance or, or greenery. There weren't, there's not a great deal of pocket parks or trees in Koreatown, and so we went about creating this project that was to create a faux landscape kit. Uh, coupled with 75 real trees that were planted in partnership with KYCC, uh, we created a corridor of fake and real verdance. And we took a uh, parking lot facing strip malls and captured their edges to reflect pedestrian activity and create a courtyard uh, formalism. We turned 75 uh, very real and concrete light poles into fake palm trees, redefining the pedestrian envelope. And we blurred the line between public and private, which we very much so love to do. Oh my God, <laughs> that poor child. <laughs> and encouraged people to use the sidewalk. Um, and for us, it's really about encouraging people or kind of seeing the city through this delightful and alternative lens. For us, LA is an attitude um, and the ability to have an inclusive design approach that is inspired by the diversity of language and people and places that represents the exuberance that we feel and the love for the city that we have. Great, thank you. Um, before we move to Chris, I'm just curious about, to, to Rostin's point earlier, the challenge of engagement when there's a lot of reasonable suspicion about the degree to which residents will be 
listened to in a meaningful way. I'm curious how your approach to that has evolved and maybe how you see maybe the public agencies approach evolving as well. I think certainly the council members' presentation suggests on the, on the policy side there's a different attitude beginning to emerge and I'm curious how that strategy has evolved from the perspective of your office. Um, I would say that initially we were invited to do community engagement because we had the ability to do it and uh, that often meant asking asking people to give their time and their expertise, and that resulted in nothing. So now I would say we're much more particular about saying yes to doing engagement only when we can translate that into something tangible, a policy outcome, a pilot project, something tangible and real. Because uh, we recognize that uh, there are too many promises and it's unfair to ask questions and have nothing in return. Um, I would also add that for us, engagement is more than a check off the box. Uh, we realize that we never want to invite people, speak at them, but really just listen understand that we are um, visitors in their neighborhood and they are the experts and doing that in a really contextual thoughtful way partnering with people who are there and listening first before we ever propose a solution we, we did get into trouble by pretending we were neutral so I would say that that was a big lesson I think you come to the table as an intellectual and you think oh, I've got all this education I'm you know I'm an honest person but you're not you have the kind you have bias from your privilege education. So that was a big learning curve with Frogtown for Turo project that we had an agenda and, and we thought affordable housing should be done and differently. And that means you bring that agenda, put it on the table at the yeah. beginning of the process now and that's, yeah. and, and what kind of response do you get to that it will, we're t then we're, talk we're having a conversation about values and people will reflect the honesty that you're sharing with them back to you. And then also, you know, and there are members of our team in the audience who have uh, shed a lot of tears and blood and sweat on LA city sidewalks. People see you building on the sidewalk for months at a time and like killing yourself and they trust you, right? We're really committing and we're really doing real things and I think people see that as worthwhile. Terrific, thank you. Chris, let's turn it over to you. Good evening, everyone. Whoa, that's loud. Hey, I'm legitimately terrified what my slides are going to look like, but um, <laughs> it's okay. Uh, thanks so much for coming out, braving the LA winter um, and sticking through to the end. I'm going to try to be as quick as I can. Oh, that's yours. Should I? Uh... I am Frederick Fisher. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna hand it over. Um, maybe in that case, we'll hand it over to Fred, and we'll save yeah. Chris for last, if you don't mind. Fred Fisher. <laughs> that would be me. Uh, thank you, Christopher, for inviting me. And um, I know that uh, you're not supposed to say which is your favorite children, but uh, these are my two favorite children. And uh, the uh, first is, um, in listening to the speakers this evening and thinking about uh, your charge to this conversation, uh, Christopher, um, I thought of two people, Albert Einstein and Percy Shelley. Um, and uh, there is no place without time. And embedded in any notion of place has to be a time for that place and that time changes and once the, the reality of that place changes through time. Um, this is a project about memory and um, thinking about Shelley, about uh, Ozymandias, and one also has, always has to contemplate the future and things which seem permanent and forever inevitably change. Um, this is the Marion Davies William Randolph Hearst estate on Santa Monica Beach. It was a hundred room uh, house that was built in the 1920s. It became the center of social life for the movie industry, uh, silent uh, as it was at the beginning, uh, and later with the talkies. Uh, Marion Davis is one, was one of the biggest stars. Uh, Hearst was one of the wealthiest men in the country. And um, this house was incongruously built on six acres on Santa Monica Beach. In the, in the distance, you can see the little guest house, which was designed by um, uh, Julia Morgan, as was the pool. So this house, um, the, uh, the beach house was active for only 20 years uh, until uh, Hearst died and Davies uh, willed it to the state. Uh, it was then sold uh, to a hotel developer 
in uh, 1947 and became the Sand and Sea Hotel, a luxury hotel. That lasted all of 10 years. And uh, then it became the Sand and Sea Club, which was uh, famous in certain communities uh, on the west side as the only open beach club. All the rest were restricted, uh, as was discussed earlier, one of the limitations. Uh, and, and there's a final step in the transition of this from the ultimate private uh, or space to the ultimate public space uh, was when the city of Santa Monica and the Annenberg Foundation got together and to create a uh, public beach and they diff did not use the word club because that would be an oxymoron. It's not a club, it's open to everyone. Uh, and that's uh, in 2009. So uh, the mansion didn't exist. It hadn't existed for um, 50 years. And, uh, but I think that architecture always speaks. It's a rhetorical art, whether one wants it to or not. And uh, you mentioned the word ghost, and that's a term that I've always used about this. I wanted to uh, basically honor the mansion by creating a ghost of the mansion. So this colonnade is the same scope, the height, the width, the color uh, of the original colonnade of the mansion in order to give us all a sense of what was there and what is not there anymore. Um, it wasn't necessary, it doesn't perform any function uh, other than to create memory. Um, and on the left is the, the uh, Julia Morgan guest house, and so you hear you have the actual artifact, which was uh, restored by Secretary of Inst with Secretary of Interior Standards uh, as, a, as a National Historic Landmark. And then we brought in uh, the artist Roy McMakin to install an artwork, um, the first uh, proposal of which of his was rejected as too uh, political. And uh, this was a more subtle version of the, the city. Um, he had been hired as an artist, and he made his first proposal, which was talking about real estate and uh, ownership and, and who owns what, uh, and that was considered to be, in a way, um, asking too many questions and provoking not conversations that they didn't necessarily want to have. So he came back with another peach, which is much more subtle, but the notion, you see the fence, a little fence and a little bit bigger fence, and the garden furniture, and it does talk about those issues of uh, ownership and uh, domesticity uh, that Roy wanted to get at. So. Um, earlier than that, um, the uh, uh, Natural History Museum of Los Angeles uh, was originally the Museum of History, Science, and Art. It was a three-part museum. One part became LACMA, and um, uh, it was uh, housed in this, um, it has been variously described as Spanish Renaissance, uh, Plateauresque, uh, Beaux-Arts, uh, but this confection uh, from 1913. And the opening celebration was actually uh, in part included uh, the, the great, uh, when M William Mulholland made that famous statement, um, when the water was released from the Owens Valley to LA, here it is, take it. Uh, the fountain in front of this in the Rose Garden spouted up with water in the opening celebration from the Owens uh, Valley. Uh, as its you know, inaugural uh, presence in, into Los Angeles. Um, so this is being built on the other side of the Natural History Museum. And this is the Lucas Museum. Um, and so the question is what to do. You have uh, the basically Roman Colosseum uh, on the top and you have George Lucas's spaceship on the bottom and you have the Plateresque uh, pastry uh, on the north side. So, how do you add to uh, add to all that? And and it's important to say this is state. <laughs> this is state property as well. I mean, this seems perfectly emblematic of some of the jurisdictional complexity that we've been talking about, right? So maybe you can talk about navigating some of that, right? You have to deal first and foremost with the state, uh, state, city, county, all involved. Um, I'd love to see the diagram similar to what you produce for your permitting. Uh, so, um, the. The story that we wanted to tell here is a, is a bigger story, that, that we are looking back at geology going back millions of years. We are looking at the dinosaurs of uh, uh, tens of millions of years. Uh, and we are looking at the con uh, contemporary culture. It's a museum of nature and culture. 
And um, so architecturally, our response was to create what was not all those other things, a timeless, simple, ethereal glass uh, prism that would uh, express time either directly as an index, as through its reflections of the clouds and the trees to make it an ethereal object, to express transparency. Many people in the community don't know what it is to go to a museum. They actually are afraid of museums, what is in that big blank box. And so we wanted to contradict that, that perception uh, and uh, hunker the museum down onto the ground, open the doors, make it actually transparent and reflecting its environment. And then on the facade, are, on two facades, are uh, the cabinet of curiosities, the inspiration, in a way, um, going back to the Victorian era, uh, of, of showing the, the uh, absolutely exquisite and amazing breadth of the 35 million objects uh, that the museum has. Uh, and finding, and what's the process which we're doing right now is to try to find a visual language to communicate all of those things which will be uh, relevant to the broad uh, array of communities that um, this uh, project addresses. Terrific, thank you, Fred. Um, let's turn to Chris's slides, which hopefully will be up next. Excellent. Um, Again, thanks so much for sticking it out to the end. Um, my name is Chris Torres. I'm a landscape, landscape architect and urban designer at uh, Super Jason Studio of Jerdy. We're a, a laboratory for landscape architecture and public space uh, working here in Los Angeles and um, in many countries around the world now. And you've just joined the larger Jerdy This is my office, right? third so, day. OK, congratulations, <laughs> yeah. congratulations. Yes. Um, so I'm gonna just very briefly just talk a little bit about what this LA sensibility means to me and, and what I think it means specifically for landscape. And so this idea of, of Eden um, to me really was this kind of meta narrative that was trying to kind of be this all encompassing notion of what Los Angeles was. So this idea of oranges growing and snow at the same time. And I think as the city's urbanized, um, it's really been an urbanization that I, many would characterize as one that's fragmented. And so in that fragmentation, the lack of a really strong public realm, the lack of a really strong landscape public experience um, wasn't really there. And what resulted was a series of boundaries, borders and edges of many different communities, many different expressions of what it means to be Los Angeles. And, and to me, it's where those borders and boundaries start rubbing up against each other. Um, to me, that, that is the sensibility. And that, that's what I find most interesting. And so, you know, s simple acts such as repurposing space, a metro station as a dance floor, um, but then you know, the other expressions. So I would say, like the Korean barbecue taco, to me is like the LA sensibility that is not fusion. It's it's um, it's barely a hybrid. It's distinctly a taco and distinctly Korean. And that bite to me, that's LA. But then also, you know, this is uh, this is the Grove, and this is. Um, a collection of celebrities I don't really know walking their dogs at the Grove. <laughs> but this, this experience of um, being able to move fluidly between public and private space, being able to move fluidly between urban and nature, being able to reflect on the past and also look towards the future, to me that, that is kind of this essence. And so, you know, these are coyotes near downtown LA, right? So like, these are these, these small, almost like sound bites of life in the city that I find so amazing and so lucky to, to live here and work here. And then, you know, so this is like, <laughs> so these are like the Compton Cowboys. Would you, and I'm going to show you a project in Compton that we've been working on. Um, to me, I don't really have to explain it. Um, so I, I'm going to jump to a couple projects I've been lucky to be a part of. Um, I worked on Grand Park towards the end of the process. Um, I'm sure you are all familiar with the park. 12 acres, over 100 feet of grade change, moving from um, City Hall up to the Music Center, creating the whole experience to be accessible for the first time from an ADA standpoint. But I think what's really interesting about the park is its ability to be originally conceived as a series of gardens, a series of botanical gardens representing the different cultures of Los Angeles but then those gardens having flexibility. And to me, it's the flexibility that's, that's most important. So there's beautiful moments, like the fountain, but there's also moments that allow for kind of the city to enter the landscape. 
And so for cultures to kind of uh, make it a space of their own, so that lawn becomes that lawn. And the ability for Los Angeles to be present, I think is, is really important in terms of how we think about landscape. And there's a gut reaction to say, okay, make it a plaza, make it a, a non-design space. But I think that's kind of like a, an easy way out. And I think it's having this balance between really specificity about who we are, but allowing flexibility for the future. So quickly, this is a project we've been working on in the studio for the last year and a half or so. This is a Compton Hub City, is what we're calling it. It's a master planning project that uh, we're working on with SOM's office here for about uh, 500 acres um, of, of Compton centered around the Art Artesia Blue Line station. And so you have these kind of industrial, kind of low rise industrial centers, big box retail, the Artesia Blue Line station landing in a sea of parking lots, about 90 acres of parking just around the train station itself. And this first diagram to us was, we just did this as a, like a land use plan and to us was kind of boring. And we, we, we've been kind of working in close collaboration with the city of Compton, and we said, you know, we really want to do a, a much more robust engagement process. Over the last year or so, we stepped back, um, and oh wow, okay, there's some people here and some models. But um, we worked hard to, we've done about eight charrettes um, with different community groups. We made a really great collaboration with the um, First Zion Baptist Church of Compton. Um, where we basically asked this question, what is Compton? And it was a moment for us, and it's really hard as designers to just listen um, and, and to not kind of project the vision. So we, we tried to sit back and what the stories that came out were stories that told wildly different versions of what was Compton. So I'm sure everyone has uh, an impression of what Compton is in your head right now, but we got stories of kind of elders in the church talking about the main street being able to walk to stores, the importance of mom and pop stores. We got families, young families that just moved there that want more parks. We got people that want to see more ecology here. And so there's kind of these wild different visions and typically in a, a planning process like this, one of these comes to the top and that becomes the kind of overarching theme. But to us, we, we pose the question back, what if these boundaries and borders and edges touched each other? And what if in that process of engaging, you created a different kind of public realm? So asking questions like, can parks and agriculture coexist? Oh, wow, okay, different, different font on this one. Um, so this is asking the question of, you know, this is this low rise um, warehousing area that actually is 95% occupied. And so people wanna keep the jobs there. And, but how do we inject there? How do we create incubators in there for new businesses to come up in terms of retail, dining, can public spaces be injected and kind of infused into this network that's already there? Wow, this is all over the place. This is kind of the heart of our project. Um, so this is um, this like 90 acre parking lot with the Artesia Blue Line station to the right, Crystal Casino in the corner, big box retail on the left, and what's directly underneath this photo is Compton Creek. So Compton Creek was actually built over, this parking lot was built over the creek in the 80s. So something that you would never conceive of doing today. Um, and so we're asking, you know, can this parking lot become a sponge to be able to harness storm water? Can it become a place for ecology? Can it become a place for community? Can it have multiple roles for multiple communities, but still allow for flexibility? And this is looking even crazier, but this is where we're at right now. This is a project that's totally on the boards. Um, and so what we're proposing is there's about a thousand units of housing, um, majority affordable housing, there's a retail component, but I think what we're most excited about is the public realm that we're trying to build. So trying to create areas where there's promenades that could be highly programmed, but also daylighting the creek, bringing ecology into the site. Um, we had a tremendous amount of interest in having more of a equestrian agricultural presence in the community, so creating a city farm for Compton, bringing in best practices in terms of green streets, um, and then actually restoring the soft bottom portion of Compton Creek that comes out from uh, the end of the parking lot as this habitat zone. Um, and so, so to us, this is uh, kind of this never-ending search for what is LA, what, are, what is each of the communities in Los Angeles, and, and in our work trying to find ways to 
really st study and get to know neighborhoods so that we could try to identify what are the, what would maybe seem opposing forces that could come together and create um, unique places. Thank you very much, uh, and I apologize if there are any graphic designers in the audience um, for what you've been through this evening. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I wanted to ask a kind of overarching question for all of you maybe, and, and maybe we should make this our last question, but you can take it in any direction that you'd like. Um, and again, t touch on what others have said if you would like to. I think one of the themes that has really come up in these convert third LA conversations since the beginning is really an attempt not just to think about three LAs in terms of a kind of historical framework, although that's certainly the basis of the idea, but also a third way of looking at the city that gets beyond this sort of lurching between sunshine and noir perspectives, right? The kind of, you know, the Eden idea versus dystopia, which we so, so often get stuck in and thinking about the real challenge ahead of us, which is as we return our attention to the public realm in a range of ways and return investment to the public realm, think about these, these sort of border conditions where we can take the river, for example, as we heard earlier, and respect both the beauty of the kind of concrete and the kind of volunteer nature and, and that, that sort of juxtaposition. Um, and I think that is a challenge in so many of the projects that I'm working on now from the city side. So my, my question to all of you is the advice that you would give us on the on the public side, how best to, what we could do to have a better, sort of more flexible framework in, in dealing with these issues, particularly um, with this question of engagement. You said the, you know, you, you said something quite different than Elizabeth and Helen about starting with a kind of neutrality. Um, but the question to all of you is what ways can, what ways can the city be smarter about thinking about a kind of authenticity in the work that we're actually producing through this process, which as we've all seen can be, um, even when the slide is not uh, messed up, super, super convoluted. So maybe we'll start with Fred. Um, I was at a discussion the other night, uh, Zocalo, LA, which was talking about museums and the Natural History Museums. Uh, Gretchen Baker uh, spoke there and the one of the notions uh, it was about the where is the place of the museum in the digital world, and as the uh, Instagram and the uh, instant access to uh, digital information has become so pervasive, and uh, one of the terms in again in your charge to us our discussion was authenticity, and I think that the uh, one of the roles of we, because we work a lot in the museum world is is that distinguishes museums from other institutions is the authenticity of the object and the experience of the object. And I think that's uh, one of the things which we struggle with and, and attempt to work with in, uh, and I think that the city needs an awareness of is the authenticity of, its own, of itself and how layered that is. Uh, there, there are, um, the building, there are many, many examples of communities that have failed to recognize their own uh, assets until it's too late. And Palm Springs is an example that they, you know, it's become the mechanism of modernism now, but many, many great structures were lost before that time, and it was on the brink of losing more uh, before people realized that actually this stuff that was considered to be uh, completely obsolete uh, is actually given a critical mass and uh, the uniqueness of the place could become an asset. But it's a, it's a trickier question, authenticity in LA, than maybe other places, right? Because of our history of embracing simulacra. And I mean, I think it's, it's important to think about the ironies and the, and the paradoxes that are always inherent in that idea of, of authenticity. Also, of course, who gets to determine what's authentic. But, you know, when, the, when Councilman Ryu's office did a study about relieving congestion on the way to the Hollywood sign. Um, one of the suggestions buried at the back of that report, which struck me as the most LA thing ever, actually, to get back to Carolina's question, was the idea that maybe we produce a replica of the Hollywood sign on the Valley side, <laughs> and that people could come and get a per, a, the perfect distance away to take a selfie. Um, and I think that is a brilliant idea and a truly Los Angeles idea. I'm not confident that it will ever happen, but just to say that this notion of authenticity maybe can play differently here than in other places. I, I, 
Thank you. Um, I would say that LA is not authentic, and it's very interesting when we're in moments where it tries to be, like Pershing Square. Like Carrie McWilliams talks about this kind of slipperiness that Pershing Square has had historically, and all of the different ways we've tried to create formality around it. And it's pretty, you know, it's interesting for us to be doing these projects and to be playing with the idea of what LA is or, or what the kind of graphic design is for a community. And it's been really fun to engage the city in a way where we're talking to people as peers because um, the two of us really like the dialogue around the no and the idea of what, you know, everyone's asking for and the push point and like the project becoming emblematic of all of the ways the city's not authentic, right? That, that's fun to play with the paperness or the, the, the surfaciness of the city. And we have people in our office who come from New York and we're doing these installation projects and we're digging down into the earth and they're asking me what's below the concrete though is there like subway and electric and we say no it's just dirt what are you talking about what's <laughs> below the sidewalk it's dirt um and that's what's so great about la is that informal the informalness the informality so i guess you were asking what also like what can the city do yeah. right and I, I guess i have a kind of boring response but the procurement is I guess my big response is the, the way that RFPs and RFQs go out don't have this discussion as part of it at all. And often design is like, you know, the last thing or a very small amount. And so finding a way to actually translate and articulate these talks into the way we actually go build projects and, and put together teams to do that, I think that's huge. And I think that sets a kind of tone and a priority from the city to say that this is not uh, kind of uh, something we're going to think about after the project's built, but this is something we're going to think about before the project's even happening. Um, yeah, sure. yes. I would say that so much of the beauty of LA is the informal nature that is all guerrilla. No one gets permits for the things we love the most, the street vendors, the signage on businesses. So I would say what the city could do is um, make their permitting process easier. Go Avenue 26 was an example to prove just that, and we're hoping to institutionalize that into new policy. But that's just the first step. Um, it means inviting, inviting community members to, make, to do it themselves in a way where you have the city supporting it rather than um, giving a citation. And I think the other thing that the city could do is that the city has so much kind of land and power in its policy and its, in its ownership and its assets. And um, unfortunately, like, you know, everyone, you know, if you're a housing person, you're, you're, you're talking about homelessness and our affordable housing crisis. If you're a park person, you're talking about park equity and how to advocate for more park space. If you're a transportation geek, you're talking about metro and the implications of that. And all these different worlds, housing, transportation, park space, often tends to be divided. Um, um, but when you want to talk about a community and its impact, it's, it's all the same. There are all these issues that are part of one neighborhood, part of one community, part of a person's lived experience. So I would encourage the city to think about how can you actually cut across those barriers of the different topics um, and think about the city's assets in terms of city-owned land and thinking about how could that be returned back to the community because as the council member mentioned gentrification is a market force that kind of happens with so many different distinct actions and what the city can do is actually say well I have the control of this market force and this city-owned property and what can I do to give it back to the community no more <laughs> No more, no more toolkits, please. Oh my God, no more toolkits. No more toolkits. There are tons of designers in the city that have great ideas. You don't need to standardize great ideas. You need to standardize how good designers get at the city. Yes, and that goes back to Chris's point about procurement. And I will say, I have spent a good chunk, if not the biggest chunk of my time since starting, thinking about these issues, looking at the models, um, I can tell you about the differences between the Flemish regional government's approach to procurement and New York City under Michael Bloomberg and the, uh, and the federal government and its design excellence program. I think this is absolutely crucial. I think the challenge, as we're finding from the point of view of my office and thinking about RFQs and RFPs, is, pr is precisely this question. It's relatively easy to say if you want certain energy performance benchmarks or resilience benchmarks in a building, 
what those look like, how to write those into an RFQ or an RFP. Writing and design excellence, of course, is a much trickier and more delicate art. And it's all the more crucial because we are investing, you know, all told, if you, if you combine the metro expansion, the river, housing bonds that we've passed, open space, the Olympics, it's somewhere on the order of $200 billion that we will be spending over the next generation or generation and a half. We will be making, for the most part, those decisions about design in the next five to 10 years. And we have lost the thread, like so many other cities, about um, how to return a sense of innovation and experimentation to that design work. So that's really, I mean, this is the primary challenge that we face as a city, right, in terms of, uh, in terms of design. But I do think there's a different conversation happening around issues like procurement, not just in my office, but across the city, um, an interest in thinking about shifting those, um, those sets of priorities. And I was trying to find, um, to your point about uh, inauthenticity, a quote, um, somebody, David Eulen, the former book, book critic at the LA Times, um, was talking about the particular, um, uh, actually it was Charles McNulty, theater critic, talking about the particular color of green that has sort of popped up on the hillsides um, after all this rain and how fake it looks because it's so bright. Um, and there's a fantastic Kerry McWilliams line about that just being paper thin and that sense of the city just sort of rubbing off in your fingers um, is something that I think does distinguish LA from other places. And I think that, you know, again, it's the, the paradox I was hoping to get at at the beginning that the celebrating the unauthentic or the superficial or the two dimensional, I mean, our most important design icon in the city is the Hollywood sign. It's a billboard, it's a two dimensional object, right? And, and, and so celebrating that sense of, of thinness even as, as something that can, um, that can reflect a more authentic idea again, authentic always in quotes and italicized and um, sort of questioned um, and, and rethought in a way that I think is, is not, um, uh, doesn't happen in the same way in other cities. And finally, I'll say in closing, I think I agree with what everyone has said about there not being a single LA sensibility, there never will be. I think what does distinguish LA, particularly at the moment, is a sense that these definitions are up for grabs and that quite a bit hangs in the balance in terms of how we define these questions in a way that I don't think is happening in most other big American cities, given how many large-scale decisions we still need to make over the next five to 10 years about what kind of place we're building with all this funding that we've identified. And I think that is really what, as I travel around to other cities and talk about LA, that's what really distinguishes us from other cities, that notion um, of how many consequential decisions are sort of hanging in the balance at the moment and how much that question of identity is always in flux, um, and I think that's something to celebrate. It gets very complicated, it gets very fraught, particularly with the historical questions that we've talked about, um, but that's the way we get to our, our, our most productive design conversations, ultimately. So with that, please join me in uh, thanking these panelists and all the panelists and speakers from earlier tonight. Thank you all, thank you all for being here, for coming, and I hope to see many of you three weeks from tonight at MOCA Grand Avenue. Thanks again. <laughs>